From Hollywood, the Hollywood Radio Theater. Starring Ginger Rogers in It Grows on Trees with Marcia Henderson and Greg Palmer. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know exactly what your reaction would be if you suddenly discovered money growing on trees in your backyard. But I imagine it would be somewhat the same as our overjoyed heroines in tonight's play. And as our star, we have that delightful comedian, Ginger Rogers, truly one of our most glamorous personalities. It Grows on Trees was turned into a screen success by Universal International Studios. And tonight, we will introduce two of their most promising young players, Marsha Henderson and Greg Palmer. Now, it grows on trees, starring Ginger Rogers as Polly, with Marsha Henderson yeah. and, and Greg Palmer as Ralph. It started off like a perfectly normal day for Polly, the usual early morning scramble involving three children of various dimensions, one loving husband, that's me, and the daily battle to get us out of the house on time. Polly! Polly, where are you? In the hall, dear. Where are you? In the bathroom. Oh, good. I was afraid one of the kids had locked you out again. I'm trying to shave. Who were you talking to just now? Mrs. Pryor. She wanted to borrow some sugar and butter. Why do you let her get away with it? Some neighbor we've got. But that woman's an outright thief. Well, uh, what I really wanted to know is what happened to this window. Where's the screen? Well, it was all rusted, dear, and full of holes, so I gave it to Mr. Gonzalez to fix. Well, it's windy outside. Look at the dust and stuff blowing in here. Well, then put the window down. I tried. I suffocated. Well, then put it halfway down. Oh, Phil, really? There. You see? Oh, it still blows in. Diane, dear. I'm getting dressed. Well, hurry, dear. Help Flip and Midge get started on breakfast. Oh, and take Midge's best shoes down to her, will you? Best shoes? Well, Midge can't possibly wear her school shoes, dear. She's worn them out. Again? Well, we'll find the money somewhere, I suppose. Oh, and, and don't forget to leave me three dollars for Mr. Gonzalez. Three bucks for one little screen? I'll pay you out of next month's house money. That makes sixteen hundred and three dollars you owe me out of next month's house money. You talk as though you don't trust me. Darling, I trust you with my life, my honor, and my children, but not with three dollars for the simple reason I can't spare it. Really, Phil, at times you have a very peculiar sense of humor. I don't see anything funny about it either. What's the idea? What idea? The five dollar bill on the windowsill. The five dollar bill on... How did that get there? Well, you put it there. I certainly did not. That is not my money. If it were mine, I assure not you... Not yours? Good. Thank you, dear. Polly, I'm serious. The wind, the open window, well, it just blew well, in. Well, I don't know where it came from, but I certainly know where it's going. It'll pay for the screen. Now, wait a minute. That five dollars belongs to somebody. It certainly isn't ours, Polly, so how can it you... It blew in our window, didn't it? And I consider it heaven sent, and I'm not going to let you get noble about it. That can mean only one thing. You've gone through your house money again. That has nothing to do with it. Besides, what's the difference today's payday? And tonight's our little budget hassle, too. Oh, not again, dear. We'll tackle it right after dinner and cook a good, substantial meal. I'll need all my fortitude for your extraordinary bookkeeping. Just wipe that lather off your face and give me a kiss. You big bully. That evening, we launched into our monthly struggle with economics. Midge and Flip promised not to make any noise, and Diane agreed to do the dishes. So the three of us sat down, Polly and I and the budget. 
Oh, I don't mind doing this, dear, but it's just a waste of time. Now, isn't it? The bills have to be paid regardless. <sighs> Item number one is milk. And there it is in black and white. Only eight dollars? Well, congratulations. That's much better uh, than last month. Eighteen dollars, dear. Huh? The one sort of ran into the K in milk. Eighteen? Eighteen dollars for milk? Who bathes in it around here? We have three growing children, and it's good for them. Oh, I'm sorry, honey. It's only that I make so little. I want us to get ahead so I can open up my own office. We'll make it one of these days. I'm a pretty good accountant, Polly, and once I get started for myself, why, I'll... Uh... Judas on a raft. What's this? What's what? Incidental expenses, nursery, ten dollars. Well, um... Polly, don't tell me... Go... Well, I mean... Oh, are you crazy? Of course not. That's Mr. Piney, the nursery man. I bought some plants. Plants? Well, not exactly plants, dear. They're, they're trees. Two nice little trees. Well, they're only four feet tall now, but in a couple of years... Oh, I, I thought you saw them. From now on, I'll bow to them. What kind of trees cost ten bucks? Well, I, I'm i not sure, but you, you see, Mr. Piney got a shipment of, of something by mistake, and, well, I don't really know, dear, except that's why I got them so cheap. Two anonymous trees, ten hard-earned bucks. But it isn't as though I bought them for myself. They're for all of us. And you know how I need to see things grow. What about needing to see our bankroll grow? What about our what about getting... Our going to the movies tonight? Flip, dear, you know Daddy and I are busy. Well, I mean later, when Ralph gets here. Ralph's taking Diane to the movies, so how come we can't go, too? I'm afraid not, Flip. We simply can't afford it. You might explain it to him, dear. We can't see the movies for the trees. Now, what on earth has she brought in this time? All right, Cassie, come on, now drop it. Come on, drop it. Another mouse? Did you ever see a green mouse? But what is it? Well, she had this all rolled up. Bill! <gasps> Wait, it's a $10 bill! Hey, kids, get in here. We've got a cat with a private income. We've got a cat? <laughs> Midge, honey, you can start charging this cat for room and board. Look. Where'd she get it? Hey, doesn't anybody answer the doorbell? Where's my date? In here, Ralph. Hi. Mrs. Baxter? Mr. Baxter? Hello, Ralph. Hello, Ralph. Better get ready, Diane. We'll miss the first show. Anything wrong here? Something wrong with the cat? Oh, Ralph, you're a bank teller. Take a look at this bill. Is, is this a good $10 bill? Well, it's chewed up a little, but I... Well, I wish I had a bushel of them. What's it all about? Yes, Nova brought it in so we could all go to the movie. Come on, let's get our coats. Now, just a minute. If this bill is good, we've got to give it back. Give it back to whom? The cat? It's Casanova's money. She wants it. It isn't anybody's money, dear. It came to us because we needed it. Polly, for heaven's sake. This morning, we needed money for the screen, and we got it. And we need money now for Midge's shoes and a little entertainment, so here it is. Oh, but, Mother, that just doesn't make sense. Your mother still believes in of fairy tales. Of course I do, and it's high time life caught up with fairy tales. Come on, kids, we're going to the movie. A five dollar bill in the morning and a ten dollar bill at night. Out of out of nowhere. Well, it was now the following evening. I was reading the paper, Polly was sewing, Midge was playing with Casanova the cat, and Flip was actually doing his homework. No problems from anyone. Except Diane. Diane, who was that on the phone, dear? Ralph. Bad news. He's been made one of the officials at the alumni dance. But that's good news. It's formal, Mother. I haven't got anything to wear. What about your blue with the silver trim? Oh, Mother. The silver's tarnished. It's much too tight. And still, uh, couldn't we take some no, of... No, Polly. Well, now, let me finish. Just a little out of the Christmas fun. No, Polly. Diane, I know Mother's doing this for your sake. I also know that I am a tyrant. Yes, Father. But from now on, we're not going to talk about money for the very simple reason that we don't have any. I'll take $19, please. Midge, I just said that we would Bill, not... for heaven's sake, she's just playing a game. What kind of a game? I'll play a stir, Papa. I'm Mr. Burns of the 
grocery and Cassie's a customer. And I take all the money, see? But that that's real money. Mother, look! Midge, where in the world did you get... 10, 20, 30, 35 dollars. Midge, honey, this is not play money. This is real money. Now, where did you get it? But I found it. I found it outside. Where, dear? Where outside? Outside in the backyard. But it must have been someplace in the backyard. Bill, she's just a little girl. Fifteen dollars yesterday and now thirty-five. But whose money is this? It's ours. <laughs> you bet it is, Mother. What is just as I said yesterday. We needed it, so it's here. It'll buy Diane's new dress. Holly, darling, you have to find the rightful owner and give it back. I'll stop off at the police station in the morning and turn it in. And I suppose you're so disgustingly honest that you'll want to give back the other 15, too. Yes. But we've already spent it. Then it will have to come out of your house, Mother. Father, now, really. Now, look, both of you. We just don't spend money we haven't come by legitimately. What you're doing, Philip Baxter, is snatching a dress right off your daughter's back. We'll drop this discussion right <laughs> you now. You just don't lie. <laughs> you're the most. Just the oh, most. Oh, I'm... All right, Polly. <laughs> How much do we have in the Christmas fund? Now, you just sit here and I'll get the little bank book. I, I think we have almost a hundred. The next day was Saturday. That afternoon, as I was watering the lawn... And don't forget the driveway, will you, dear? Oh, and the two little trees. You will be careful, won't you, Phil? You won't water the leaves because the buds might fall off. What kind of trees have buds this time of year? But I told you, dear. Even Mr. Piney doesn't know what kind they are. Oh, incidentally, did you, uh, stop off at the police station? I did. Uh, they probably thought you were crazy. Oh, no, they didn't. They thought I was a good citizen. What's more, I'll bet that right now somebody's come in and claimed it. Probably someone who needs it very badly. Mother, I'm ready. Diane's new dress, we're fixing the hem. I'll be right up here. Uh, don't forget the driveway. Well, I was doing the driveway when a police car drew up to the curb. Hiya. Hi. You the man who turned that money this morning? I am. Well, I just stopped by to let you know it's been claimed. Good, I'm glad. Someone who needed it out bet, huh? Sure looked like it. Never saw anyone so glad to pick up 50 bucks. They uh, leave any name? Uh, yeah, uh, Mrs. Uh, Polly Baxter. Uh. <laughs> who? Mrs. Polly Baxter. She'll probably get in touch with you. It, yes. Yes, I'm sure she will. <laughs> Phil, stop it at once. If you've got to yell, come in the house. I am not going in the house or anywhere until you tell me why. Why did you go to that police station? Because the money is ours. That's insane. And we needed it very badly. There are some things I didn't want to tell you, but... Now you... I'll have to go back to the police and tell them my wife's a thief. I didn't want to tell you because well, you, you've been so worried already about my I'll life. have to confess to them that my wife, my and own wife... the doctor wife... says that Midge has to have her tonsils adenoids out this coming week, and I thought that $50 would help pay. Polly, will you please listen to me? No. You listen to me. I'm sick of scrimping and being afraid to spend a nickel. And if it's a crime to see that your sick child gets well and not to worry your husband, whom you love, although he doesn't appreciate it, about money which he hasn't got and can't get, then I'm a thief. And you can throw me in jail and let me rot there. But the minute I get out, I'll do it all over again. No, Polly. All you do is just stand there and say horrid things to me when all of my thoughts are for you and our children. Oh, Phil, when I see the look on your face at night. What look? The look on your face and the shine on your pants. I could just die. No, 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 sweetheart. <laughs> Don't cry, Polly. You, you know what happens to me when you start to cry. It wasn't wrong. And even if it was, I'm still right. No, no, no. We've always talked these things over, honey. Just stop crying and calm down and we'll, we'll, we'll. we'll... Polly. Polly, look. Oh, no, no. <gasps> More money. What the wind is. Blowing money all around us. Phil! Five! Ten! Fifteen! Twenty! 
There's a plane up there, an airplane. The money must have fallen out of that plane. Oh, oh, don't just stand there. Pick it up. No, 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 no. I'll pick it up. You just get me something to put it in. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful afternoon. Act two of It Goes on Trees in just a few moments. Make a friend and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. Since the end of World War II, many American cities have adopted European ones, mainly through the work of a citizen group in New York called Operation Democracy. One of the greatest ties of friendship has been made between American cities and towns in Holland. The people of the American cities supply their Dutch friends with clothing, food. And during the floods early in 1953, the Americans won the undying gratitude of the Hollanders for their help. Several of the American communities have raised money to send a community ambassador to visit the European town they've adopted. And the children keep up a two-way correspondence. To date, several hundred towns in the United States are in contact with others overseas. And the number is steadily increasing. These contacts include towns in 13 European countries, as well as Japan and Hawaii. Recently, three more countries were added, Norway, Yugoslavia, and India. And arrangements have been started to include Turkey, Spain, and Peru. Americans in every walk of life have done something to satisfy their desire for international friendship. And you, too, can learn, as they did that by helping others, you help your country. Now our producer, Mr. Cummings. Act two of It Grows on Trees, starring Ginger Rogers as Polly, with Marsha Henderson as Diane, Greg Palmer as Ralph, and Ted DeCossia as Phil. I left Polly in the backyard and ran into the house. I called the airport. No, no planes had been flying around dropping five and ten dollar bills. And just then, Polly rushed in. Phil, Phil, you've got to come out and look at those trees. Darling, this is no time for me to look. You won't believe me. You will think I'm crazy. The buds, the little buds have opened. Well, that's fine, dear, but what's a little more important is where did that money come from? That's what I'm trying to tell you. The trees. Instead of flowers, they're five-dollar bills and, and ten-dollar bills. Phil, you don't believe me. About the money. You are not to spend one cent of it. That is an order. But Major's tonsils... We'll borrow on our insurance. Now, what did you do with the money? It's in the kitchen cupboard in the salad bowl. See that it stays there. There's some more of it in the cookie jar. Quite a bit more. Polly, you're not to mention this to a soul. Not until I've figured out something. Just as you say, dear. Oh, my, but this is fun. I don't know how much money rested in our kitchen cupboard that night. All I know is that by bedtime, I still hadn't reached any sort of a sensible conclusion. It's a lovely night, Phil. Did you notice how bright the stars are? No one thing is certain. No one is just throwing money away. Polly, have you heard of anyone else finding money? And such a big yellow moon. Are you listening? Of course, dear. They couldn't have found any. Why couldn't they have? Because I would... Uh, I would have heard about it. Well, we'll just give it to charity or something. Good night, honey. Phil, suppose it did. Suppose it did what? Fall out of the trees or grow on trees. Oh, Polly, please. Uh, Well, could we spend it? Of course not. Look, honey, I'm awfully tired. But uh, why couldn't we spend it? Because it wouldn't be money issued by the government. But if it looked like the government had issued it, I mean, supposing you couldn't tell... Money like that could upset the monetary balance of the United States. It could cause a lot of trouble for a lot of people, including us. Well, I don't see why. It wouldn't be legal, that's why. Now, please, go to sleep. Phil, 
are peaches legal? What have peaches got to do with it? Well, if someone grew peaches on a tree and then he sold them and got money for them, the government wouldn't object to that, would they? No, they would not object. Well, then why would they object if someone found or grew money and exchanged it for peaches? It's the same thing the other way around. (laughs) Well, isn't it? I am taking this pillow. I am placing it firmly over my face, and I am going to sleep. Bill, just one more question. I promise that's all. Yes, dear. What's the name of the Secretary of the Treasury? And both trees are growing money. The tree nearest the garage is in the shade and produces $5 bills. But the other one gets full sun and grows $10 bills. I've already used some of the money. However, I'm a little puzzled since my husband, who is the soul of honor, says that money that grows on trees is not legal, is it? I would appreciate your opinion very much because if the money is legal, it would be a real blessing. Now, could you just read that back, Miss Fletcher, please, from the beginning? Yes, sir. Dear Mrs. Baxter, in reply to your very interesting and unusual communication... May I say that if you are in possession of trees which produce the currency of our country, and if it meets all our standards, it is my opinion that the money is perfectly legal. (laughs) You're joking, aren't you, sir? Oh, no, I'm not. If her money meets all the standards. What's wrong with that? Uh, Sorry, Mr. Murchison. Now, a new paragraph. If you could send us some cuttings from your money trees... Perhaps we could plant them in back of the White House. (laughs) This would please the president, I'm sure, since he would no longer have to send budget requests to Congress, a procedure which he frequently finds very discouraging. Thanking you in advance, I remain, et cetera, et cetera. Mr. Murchison, are you really going to send this? Why, that poor woman's liable to take it seriously. Just as seriously as I take the information that money grows on trees. But now, I... type it up. You, Miss Baxter. Oh, hello, Mrs. Pryor. I was just reading my mail. Oh, just one letter, huh? Oh, but it was the one I was waiting for from Washington. You got friends in Washington? I have now. Huh? Um, I was wondering, well, since you're my nicest neighbor, you got any extra milk? Sorry, we used it all at breakfast. Oh. Well, then I guess there's no use borrowing a cup of oatmeal. No. It's not very good without milk, is it? Uh, Say, I've been wondering about those trees of yours. What about them? You've been covering them up so careful with those old sheets. Seems to me it's too early to be worrying about frost. Oh, well. Well, they're very delicate, you know. What kind did you say they were? Oh, well, they're a sort of... A sort of mint. Oh. Good morning, Mrs. Oh. Polly never told me about getting a letter from Washington. It was a secret between her and the United States Treasury. Meanwhile, I had something else to think about. Our daughter, Diane, announced her engagement to Ralph, that nice young fellow from the bank. Oh, I know that Ralph's just been promoted, dear, and he's making a very nice salary now, but Phil, they're such children. Now, now, honey. We weren't much older. We managed to grow up, didn't we? Now, what about the wedding? Oh, well, we'll have a church wedding, of course, and the reception at the country club, and we can rent the ballroom, and I think the bridesmaids should wear taffeta. Yep. 
taffeta. Phil, do you think that we should have no. ushers? No, 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 slow down. There's some ridiculous custom that the father of the bride pays the bills, although custom evades the question as to how the poor guy gets the money. Oh, money. Oh, that. Well, I wouldn't have brought it up except that next month you're going to be handling ours all by yourself. Phil. Yes, the firm's sending me to Baltimore. I leave Saturday. For a, for a whole month? Well, don't be so happy about it. Oh, oh, well, I'm not. I'm not. This Baltimore outfit's one of our biggest clients, dear, and if they like me, well, this could be the opening wedge and setting up for myself. Phil, oh, I have a wonderful idea. By the time you get back, the kids will be ready to get married, and they'll go off on their honeymoon, and we'll go, too. With them? Of course not. We'll go on a second honeymoon with Midge and Flip. You've always wanted to go to Hawaii. Now, now, come on into the kitchen and I'll make some coffee. I'll make some sense, too, while you're at it. <laughs> if you only knew how much sense I was making. <laughs> the hair that you have left on your head would stand on end. <laughs> and let me tell you something. The real reason why I married you. Oh? Not because you're so pretty. Not even because of all that personality. No, I married you for your brains. They disturbed me then, and they disturb me now more than ever. Oh. Well, you, you just wait. You'll be so proud of me. You, <laughs> you boss. The day I went to Baltimore, as I later discovered, Polly went to the bank. A little visit to our prospective son-in-law. Here's the money, Ralph. Seventeen hundred and eighteen dollars, and that pays our mug, ma, m, our mortgage off in full. <laughs> well, good for you, Mrs. Baxter. I am. Uh, I am a little nervous because I had a little windfall. <laughs> yes, I see. Looks more like a hurricane to me. Uh, I bet I know exactly where you got this money. You, you do. Mm -hmm. You've been holding out on Mr. Baxter, haven't you? You know, a few bucks here and there out of the budget. Oh, every woman does it. You want to know how I figured this out? I'm dying to know. Well, you brought in cash and all fives and tens. If you'd held out anything bigger, he'd have got suspicious. You know, Ralph, I'm awfully glad Diane's going to marry you. Well, thank you. Now, let's see. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. I've got so many things to do today. Oh, shopping, Oh, huh? yes, in a way. Well, I... Um... I have to have the house painted, and we need a new picket fence, and I think Midge and Flip should have a new television set. Oh, take it easy, Mrs. Baxter. You can't grow this kind of cabbage, you know. Oh, I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> Didn't Diane tell you? I have a green thumb. <laughs> Four weeks later, I came home from Baltimore. It was all I could do to recognize my house. Freshly painted, a new fence, I couldn't understand it. I couldn't understand Polly either when I walked in. Why, Phil, what are you doing here? I live here, remember? Well, I wasn't expecting you until tomorrow, dear. Tomorrow? I was due home yesterday. Hi, darling. Oh, I, I'm so glad to see you. But... If you were due home yesterday, where were you? I might have worried. Well, you should have. I was in jail. Phil! Along with 20 drunks. You weren't drinking. Drinking? That's only a misdemeanor. I'm in the big time. I got jugged for passing counterfeit money. But where could you have picked up counterfeit money? Polly, remember before I left, I gave you my expense check. I, I, I asked you to get it cashed for me. Oh, oh, that. As long as I live, I'll never understand it. Anyway, the night before last, I took the client out for dinner, drinks, steaks, brandy, the works. Fortunately, he had to leave early, so I had another brandy, and then I asked for the check. Incidentally, what's been going on here? The house, I, I, I don't get it. I'll tell you all about that later, dear. Just tell me about you. Well, I pulled out my wallet, all fives and tens, remember, and then the darndest thing I ever saw. What? One of the tens broke right in half. <gasps> Another ten was kind of curled around the edges. When I tried to straighten it out, it just crumbled to bits. And the five dollar bill, well, it just curled up and then sort of granulated. Granulated? I looked in my wallet again, and it, it was full of 
crumbly bits of stuff like, like dust and ashes. No. No, no, it isn't possible. That's what I told the cops when they came for me. The client had to spring me. Here, here, just look in my wallet. You see? I'm going to take it down to the bank in the morning, see if I can't get them to replace the money. Now, uh, but about the kids? Are they all right? Oh, oh just find it. They'll be home soon. And what about all this redecorating? Bill, you must be awfully tired. Why don't you take a shower and a nice long nap? Well, I am kind of bush, maybe. I, I, I won't even call you for supper. Polly, you know what that stuff in my wallet reminds me of? Dead uh, leaves. Dead leaves? <laughs> now, you tell me, how could that happen to money? <laughs> Dear, oh, I, I've just been out in the backyard cleaning up. Have a nice nap? Oh, fine, fine. Well, I'll, I'll get you something to eat. That can wait. I wouldn't digest it. Polly, I have here a stack of bills I found upstairs. Oh, but they're not bills, dear. They, they've all been paid. You just didn't look. I looked. Washing machine, television set, painting, fence, draperies, all paid in full. But how? What with? Oh, well, not now, dear. There, there's something I, I want to see on the back porch. It'll keep. I hope so. What I want to know is where. And where I got the money for everything. Well, I... I just can't tell you. I got it honestly and legally, only... Only you'd say it wasn't, and you'd want me to stop spending it or give it back. Or... If you came by it honestly, why should I object? Because you're just too, too ethical and righteous and and wrong, wrong, wrong. Besides, uh, things were happening which I, I uh, didn't expect. And, well, you've got to give me time to work them out somehow. You sure you wouldn't like a little sardine sandwich or well, a nice time well. Just go away and leave me alone. Diane. Diane and Ralph. But, honey, I didn't say your mother was a thief. Diane, come in, please. Hello, Daddy. Oh, Mother, he did. He did say that you... He didn't. I only said... He said that you gave him some bad money. And that's why he's been demoted at the bank. And now he can't marry me. Oh, my poor, poor <laughs> baby. Mrs. Baxter, please. All I said is that since I'm getting less salary again, we'll just have to wait. What he's trying to do is break off our engagement, which is just simply fine with me. It's just the way I want it. Only he needn't call my mother a counterfeiter in order to do it. Now, let's be calm, Rob. Let's take it easy now, boy. What's all this nonsense about my wife giving you money? Any kind of money, let alone dad. Well, sir... Oh, no. I'm not going to stand here and listen to him say it again. Diane. And don't try to shush me, Father. I'm too old to be bullied. And if you're going to let him stay in this house after the things he said about your, your loving and devoted wife, well, if you're no better than he is... We'll try it again, Ralph. Mr. Baxter, I'm not trying to break our engagement. Believe me, I love Diane. It's just that Mr. Sleemish, he's the bank manager, well, he demoted me on account of the money. But I didn't say that you were what she said I said, Mrs. Baxter, honestly. And I wouldn't tell him who you were. Oh, dear, oh, dear. I only said the money you gave me to pay off the mortgage was, well, it was sort of funny, Mrs. Baxter. You mean the installment on the mortgage, son? Oh, no, sir, in full. Uh, Paid it off in full. <laughs> only it wasn't any good. What was wrong with it? Well, sir, uh... It crumbled. Mr. Sleemish didn't like that at all. Crumbled, sort of granulated? Yes, sir. Never saw anything like that in my life. Ralph, Ralph, not five and ten dollar bills. How did you know? I have moments of clairvoyance. Well, I guess I started something all right. I just don't know what to say, believe me. But if anything happened to me and Diane, and if this wasn't going to be my family, well, I, I just couldn't take it. Well, Polly... Don't you think it's about time you told me where you got this unhappy money? It grows on our trees. I beg your pardon. It does. On the trees I bought from Mr. Piney. Your expense check, I didn't cash it at the bank. I cashed it at the trees. And I suppose the chief teller there is a woodpecker? You don't believe me. You just... Don't believe me. We'll 
We'll return to Act Three of It Grows on Trees shortly. Make a friend and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. That's a thought which the 4-H Clubs of America had in mind when they began sponsoring the International Farm Youth Exchange. The main purpose of the IFYE is to select young farmers or those who've majored in university agricultural courses whom they send abroad for short periods to work with the people and promote understanding and friendship. Last summer, for example... Three young California farmers were chosen to spend four to five months in Ecuador. While there, they visited farms, discussed agriculture with the people, and lent what assistance they could. The work of these grassroots ambassadors, as they are called, is voluntary. For although their trips are sponsored by the 4-H clubs in their neighborhood, the major portion of their expenses is paid by the young farmers themselves. Their work can in no way be considered charity because they learn as much from people in other countries as those people learn from them. Yes, members of the International Farm Youth Exchange have learned the secret of international understanding, that by helping others, you help your country. We pause now for station identification. Curtain Rises on Act Three of It Grows on Trees, starring Ginger Rogers as Polly with Marsha Henderson as Diane, Greg Palmer as Ralph, and Ted DeCossia as Phil. Polly took me by the hand and led me out onto the back porch. She took a blanket off her wash basket. It was full of money. Don't say a word until I've finished. All right, you see all this money? Well, something's happening to it. The bills are drying up. I suppose I could complain to Mr. Piney. Please, Polly, don't. Well, after all, it's only a plant. You yourself said it reminded you of dead leaves. Anyway, I don't think they're quite dead. I've been sprinkling them with a little cool spray every hour, like they do lettuce at the market. Oh, good, good. I'll write the Treasury Department again, that nice Mr. Murchison. You'll what again? Well, of course I wrote them. That's how I found out it was legal. This time I'll ask if there isn't some preservative to keep them alive. After all, that's why we pay taxes, isn't it? Well, now, now, I'll, we'll walk out into the backyard. Yes, dear. Oh, I know exactly how you feel, why... When I found out that the trees had money growing on them, well, believe me, it was quite a shock. But uh, you'll get used to the idea just like I did. Now, now, prepare yourself, dear. You've never seen anything like this tree before. I'll just throw off the sheet and there before your eyes is a genuine 100%. Well, my money tree, it's pear. There was not a bud, not a leaf. Oh, it's been stripped. Better cover it up, Polly. It looks awfully naked to me, too. <laughs> now, what about the other one? Oh, you do it. You look. I'm afraid to. Of course, dear. <gasps> Both of them. Well, what could have happened? Well, Phil, they were just loaded with... Darling, the... please, when will you tell me the truth? So I'm crazy. I've lost my buttons. All right. Will you believe the United States government, the Treasury Department? Yes, implicitly. Mr. Merchantson's letter is right there on the shelf in the kitchen cabinet. Go ahead and spend the money, he said. That's just what he said. He even asked me to send them some cuttings for the White House. And if you think a man like Mr. Merchant... I stood in the kitchen as Polly frantically searched for the letter, but of course there was no letter. It was here, it was, it was, and I'm not crazy and I don't tell lies. Not big ones. And well, it does grow on trees. Of course it does, sweetheart, of course. And if you think I'm making it up about the letter, too, well, then... Well, you can just go next door and ask Mrs. Pryor. She saw me the day I got the letter. She, she even asked me... 
Mrs. Pryor. Bill, she's taken it. She's done something with it. Now, take it easy, yes. honey. I know how Mrs. Pryor comes in here and helps us up, but she wouldn't take a letter, now would she? Who called her a thief? Did I? Oh, no, you did. Polly, please listen to me. And she's taken some of the money, too. Oh, now I'm sure of it. At first, I thought I hadn't counted it right. I even... Oh, you've got to talk to her, Phil. It, it Really, it isn't the money I care about. It... It's what you think of me, and it, it does grow on trees. It does. It does. Well, it seems that at just about that time, our nimble-fingered neighbor, Mrs. Pryor, dropped in at the bank. Ralph just happened to observe her. Naturally, he called his boss. You give me back my money. Oh, you wait till I get a lawyer. You call this joint a bank? Why, it's nothing more no, than... No, a... no, 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 madam. Of course you can have your money. All we want to know is where these five and ten dollar bills came from. None of your business, that's where. I suppose you're going to tell me they're not legal. All right, I will. I do not consider this money legal. Well, it just so happens that the United States government does. Here, here's a letter to prove it. Huh? You see this? Well, what does it say? United States Treasury Department. Oh, you just wait. But this letter's addressed to, to Mrs. Philip Baxter. Wait, you just give me back that letter. I'll take my trade where it's appreciated. Ralph. Yes, sir? I'll thank you to step back in my office. I'm going to get to the bottom of this right now. And Ralph wasn't joking, Mother. I'd just been down there. He's in jail. Ralph's in jail. But, but what did he do? He kept his mouth shut, that's what. He won't say a word. He's protecting you. And that... That money you gave him for the mortgage. Oh, now, now, baby. They're not going to keep Ralph in jail. I, I just won't let them. What can you do? Well, I'm... I'm going down there and get him out right now. And, and don't you worry. Uh, if I don't come back, dear, uh, explain it to Father, will you? <laughs> Yes, ma'am. What can I do for you? Well, I'm Mrs. Polly Baxter, and I've come here about Ralph Bowen. You've thrown him in that nasty little jail back there. We sure have, lady. Well, you can just go back there and let him out at once. At once. He's not guilty. I am. I gave him that money. That phony Gatiss? Now, listen to me. It is not phony. It just happens to be dying. You see, when I gave that money to Mr. Bowen, I'd quite forgotten that it was a growing thing, that all things that grow but must... You'd forgotten what was a growing thing, lady? The money. It grows on my trees. Oh, I know. I know. My own husband doesn't believe me, but it's true. Lady, uh, you may be running a little temperature. You, uh, you maybe don't feel so good. I feel fine, and I demand that you release Ralph Bowen. Madam. Yes. Get out of my police station! <laughs> well, that did it. That just busted it wide open, that's all. You see, a reporter just happened to be at the police station. By morning, you could have read about Polly and her money trees in any newspaper in any part of the world. The result? Shambles. Get your tree inspector badges, folks. Get your tree inspector badges. Here you are, only two bits. Who Get wants fun? Who wants a tree burger? They're hot, folks. They're delicious. All right, who's next? They're hot. They're nourishing. They're Just delectable. Just a minute, Bob. See. Where do you think you're going? Home. I happen to live here, officer. You her husband? Yes. Gee, that's a shame. Here you are, ladies and gentlemen. Get your souvenirs. Get your branches from our tree. Here are you ten cents. Buy a branch from my tree. Midge, flip. Hiya, Pop. Who are we making money? These branches. You mean these came from Mama's trees? Pop, not so loud. They're from the trees out front here. But that's not honest. Well, there are trees too, ain't they? Get your souvenirs. Then you have branches right from our tree. <laughs> Phil, you've never seen anything like it. Why, the phone hasn't stopped ringing all morning. I finally had to take it off the hook. 
Polly, do you know that Flip and Midge are practicing petty larceny on our sidewalk, on your public? Now, where's Diane? In jail, dear. What's she done? Nothing. She's waiting for Ralph. They're, they're going to let him out on bail. Well, where do we go from here, Polly? Well, now that you ask me... Uh, never mind. I know where. I'll take Ralph's old cell, and you can double up with Mrs. Pryor. Phil. Phil, look. The window, there's a car turning into our driveway. And that license plate. Oh, my. United States government. <laughs> We met them in the backyard, Mr. Murchison from the Treasury Department, Mr. Leatherby from the Internal Revenue, and uh, Dr. Burroughs, Botanical Research. And I'm Polly Baxter. Well, gentlemen, this is a great honor, I'm sure. At the risk of sounding rude, Mr. and Mrs. Baxter, it's my opinion that this whole thing is a hoax. These two trees... Why, they don't even look capable of growing leaves, let alone money. What's your opinion, Dr. Burroughs? Well, well, they're probably deciduous, Mr. Murchison, oh. which means they lose their foliage this late in the season. Oh, no, no, no. It was all Mrs. Pryor. She picked them there. Well, you must have read her confession. It was in all the newspapers. Polly, please. Mrs. Baxter, do you actually believe these trees grow money? Of course they do. Why else would I have written to you about them? Very, very curious. In all my experience, I've never run across this particular species. You see, the bud, well, they're they're just like tulips. Ah. And and when they open, inside each was was a lovely little green ten dollar bill, and on that one, five dollar bills. Fascinating. Oh, we've got to put a stop to this, Mrs. Baxter, and you're the only one who can do it. But. But how? Uh, by issuing a statement that was all a deliberate hoax. Yes. Oh, but I couldn't do that. It wouldn't be the truth. Besides, Mr. Murchison, if she did, well, there's the letter you signed. You not only condoned, you also encouraged, which makes you an accessory and equally culpable. I am not going to let you make Mrs. Baxter your scapegoat. Thank you, dear. That was very nice of you. Mr. Baxter, have you actually seen money on those trees? No. But my wife, and I've had her nearly 20 years, and I should know her by now, is an honest woman. And if she says her trees grow money, then her trees grow money. But, my dear sir, it sounds like a... Like, like a, a wish come true. And that's exactly what it was. And that's what makes life so full of wonder. Does anyone know what she's talking about? I'm talking about wonder. Personally, I wouldn't want to live in a world without it. And the world does have it, you know. It, it's just full of wonder. Except people forget. Or even when they grow up, they meet it and they call it phony and, and fake. Uh, gentlemen, gentlemen, I have a wonderful news. Well, Barrow, what is it? What is it? I re-examined the trees, and one of them, the $10 tree, is, is expecting. It has a bud on it. A bud? A uh, uh, money bud? Well... Pick it off. Open it. Oh, I should say not, Mr. Leatherby. Why, it's much too early. When? When? About five days, Mr. Murchison. Oh, my. If the weather will only stay nice and mild like this for a few days. Oh, it will. It just must. So what happened? It got wet and colder, rain and frost. Dr. Burroughs kept his patient as warm as he could, but on the fifth day, he staggered in with a bullet. Well, Burroughs. Oh, I'm afraid it's moribund, Mr. Murchison. An extremist. What's that mean in English? The bud is dying. Phil! <laughs> Pardon me, please. I think I'll make a phone call. If anybody wants me, I'll be outside. I'm still trying, you know. Mr. Murchison made several calls. An hour later, a delegation of reporters and photographers crowded into our living room. And now, gentlemen, I can give you the statement you waited for so patiently. The bud has proved to be a washout. This not only vindicates us, but it takes the case out of the realm of abracadabra and makes it instead the willful passing of illegal money. Now, I spoke to well, the Father, Attorney Mother General found it. Oh, it's and I asked that you him ever to take saw. immediate action oh, against Mrs. Holly Back. The Attorney Diane. General. Oh, I'm dying. As a matter of fact, the boy got come this afternoon and pick out our tree. 
Miss Baxter, I am... Oh, fi- sorry. Excuse me, please. And pardon me. Oh, Valve, isn't this wonderful? Oh, in the bedroom. It's going to be perfectly oh, dreamy. Bill. Baby blue organdy. Oh, no. Oh, Phil, did you hear baby blue organdy? Mrs. Baxter, won't you please... Oh, come on, Ralph. We'd better hurry. See you later, huh? Goodbye, Mother. Goodbye, Daddy. Mr. Murchison, isn't young love just wonderful? Now, all you gentlemen stay right here. I'm sure you'd like some coffee. I'll have it made in no time. Oh, what a day. Oh, hello, Dr. Burrow. Oh, it's wonderful day, Mrs. Baxter. Simply wonderful. What's wonderful about it, Burrow? Something quite miraculous has happened. I've never seen anything like it before. Like what? Well, as you know, the bud was in very bad shape this morning. Quite hopeless, in fact. You told us that an hour ago. Ah, but what I didn't tell you is that it was also in a very critical condition last night. So, I plucked it off. And all night, I kept it next to me. And the warmth of my body underneath the blanket, well, that did it. Did what? Revived it. Brought it back to life. It's, it's not, it's not a, 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 a money bond. Oh, well, I haven't looked yet, but I've got it right here. Well, let's open it. Why well, don't stand back, everyone. Stand back, please. Oh, Phil, I just can't bear to watch. Steady, Polly. Steady, girl. All right. Here we go. Slowly, carefully, Dr. Burroughs opened the bud, and so help me, there inside was a tiny $10 bill. New York Stock Exchange closes. Wall Street panics. Murchison admits three grows cash. Congress calls special session in money crisis. That night, Mr. Murchison and company held another little session in our living room. And so it would seem that the matter of a capital gains tax, Mrs. Baxter, won't do at all. No, indeed. I'm afraid that now you'll have to pay the regular income tax. Well, don't worry, gentlemen. We should have a new crop by March the 15th. We'll pay in cash. This is absurd. All we have to do is appropriate the trees by due process of law. But according to the Bill of Rights, Mr. Leatherby, no private property may be taken for public use without just compensation. Well, naturally, we'll pay. How much and with what? With money, we grow our own. <laughs> It seems to me that it's your patriotic duty to give up those trees so we can destroy them. They're a menace to the economy of our country. I never intended keeping them, and I've never approved of using the money. My wife will confirm that. We can have them then. Just a minute. You've pushed my wife around, and I don't like that. You've called her names, too. All right, we apologize. Mm. Don't we? uh, Well, there's something else. Uh, What did you call it, Phil? Just compensation. What about just compensation? Well, just that the money I've spent will have to be replaced, and we haven't got it. We'll take care of that, Mrs. Baxter. Of course we will. Uh, How much? $2,904. I have a full account of everything right here, gentlemen. My husband is a certified public accountant in business for himself now. You'll have the money today. Now, where's Burroughs? He'll have to prepare the trees for shipment to Washington. I'm right here. Oh, this is terrible, Mrs. Baxter. Simply terrible. Uh, What now? It's all my fault. I went to the hotel to write my report to the Institute, and I... I quite forgot what the weather was like outside, and... and the trees. Dead? They're dead? The frost? I'm afraid so, Mrs. Baxter. Oh, this is the end. Gentlemen, this is positively the end. The end? Well, not quite. Just as the gentleman left, a delivery boy arrived. A a package for Polly. Oh, Phil, isn't it just darling? And you know what? All it cost me was $6.40. Polly, what is that thing? What is it? Well, it's a lamp, of course. That piece of junk's a lamp? 
It's a lovely little antique lamb. Six dollars and forty cents, Polly. Honey, won't you ever understand? Just because something is cheap, that doesn't well, mean... Well, you just wait and see. Oh, I admit it's a little tarnished and battered, maybe, but my goodness, once I clean it up... Oh, Phil, please don't scold me today. I'm not scolding you. I know how you feel about those trees, but really, Polly... Wasn't it all for the best wonder and enchantment? Well, they just don't fit in with everyday life. No more than this, this crummy old lamp. Yes, dear, but as long as I've got it. Okay, clean it up, have fun. See you later, sweetheart. If that isn't just like a man. Just because it's a little messy, just because it has a dent or two... <laughs> Why, it's a beautiful little lamp. It won't take a minute to clean it. I'll just take this little car cloth and I'll start rubbing it and shining it. Smoke. It's starting to smoke. A billowy cloud of... A genie. Why, there's a genie in it. Phil, Phil, the most wonderful thing. You won't believe me with the lamp I just bought. moment, Ginger Rogers will return. Up in Newfoundland, there's an Air Force base called Fort McAndrew. Two tech sergeants were out on the field one day and noticed a nine-year-old girl hobbling around on a pair of crutches. She was a polio victim and a cripple. Her father, whom they finally located after much questioning of the girl, was a civilian employee on the field. He had eight children and simply couldn't afford the costly treatments that will be necessary to help his little girl. Well, that was enough for the two sergeants. They got up entertainments, collected donations, and, well, soon every enlisted man, officer, and civilian worker around the place was in on the project. They raised $4,300, enough to fly the little girl to the United States and provide treatments at Warm Springs, Georgia. Such acts by you and your friends today are shaping our world of tomorrow. Now, Mr. Cummings and our star. And we welcome Ginger Rogers to our footlights for a justly deserved curtain call. <laughs> and I would like to add a word for Marsha and Greg. I think they were wonderful. We're always happy to give a boost to our young players and watch them rise to stardom. Now... How about your play for next week, Irving? Our play for next week was first a Broadway success, then made into an excellent picture by J. Arthur Rank in England, and released here by Universal International. It's the Browning version. And as our stars, we have invited one of the most beloved couples in Hollywood, Ronald Coleman and Benita Hume. Appearing with the Colemans will be Hugh O'Brien from Universal International. Oh, I wouldn't miss the combination like that. Good night, Irving. Good night. You had a wonderful time. The Hollywood Radio Theater is produced by Mr. Irving Cummings. Our orchestra is under the direction of Rudy Schrager. This is Ken Carpenter inviting you to join us next week at this same time for another presentation of the Hollywood Radio Theater. Radio Theater is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.